nebulous blob for us, but I'll go through, you know, the history and the background of the, what I've learned here. Yes, I love the nebulous blobs. So, I'm going to go through my background a little bit here, and um, one of the things I want to point out that, um, as a kid, uh, one of the things I've always was interested in is, was the whole mass communications and radio, TV, mostly radio, and one of the things that bugged me was, um, I always felt growing up like in the early 80s that I was born like 20 years too late to get into the, the cool stuff when you know FM was being invented and all that. It was possible for a little guy to get into the business and, and own a station, you know. And even as a little kid, I realized that the whole thing went corporate and it takes millions of dollars and lots of lawyers even think about getting started. And even then, you can't, you know, you're locked out. So. It was my dream that one day something would happen and I could get a chance to go into the go into this uh, uh, media space and make the story of how that came to be a reality without me realizing it. So, um, as a kid, um, my dad introduced me to rocketry in, in the early '80s. I was, I don't know, uh, probably an early tweener kind of thing, and we would get together once a week and fly rockets out in the, uh, the field. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And um, I, I got it involved with all kinds of experience, experiments. And my big vision was to come up with a, a remote controlled version of a shuttle kind of thing, you know, separate from the rocket and fly it back down. I was a kid, didn't really know how, you know, how I was going to go about doing that. Um, so I started experimenting around with uh, radio transmitters because, like, well, she, you know, I'm young, so I didn't know, well, well would that stuff even work? Coming off a rocket, would it work fast or something? Well, let me build something and see. So I built a uh, radio transmitter uh, out of an electronics kit my dad gave me uh, back in 82. And the first project I did was to make a little um, AM transmitter with it, because it was one of the uh, uh, projects that you could build. And once I did that and started playing around and having music playing, that kind of changed everything and that kind of almost immediately put a stop on that rocketry hobby and that's when I kind of dropped out of the rocketry hobby. Um, only to get back in later, but we'll get to that. Um, so as I continued poking around with that, I started, I made an FM transmitter. <laughs> so I was broadcasting on FM and then over time the transmitter uh, started getting uh, more and more powerful and I started experimenting around and I started building my own studio equipment because of course I couldn't, you know, being a young kid I just didn't have money to buy into this stuff. So I figured out how it all worked and I, and I did it. Um, eventually, I, when I got out of school and all that in 89, I got started in radio, I kind of fell into the business. Um, my whole focus before that was being on air, DJ kind of thing. So I got in a radio station for a first job and realized that um, DJ jobs aren't very stable. <laughs> and uh, unless you like moving around everywhere and looking for a new job constantly, it's probably not a good idea. But I did understand all the tech that was going on in the radio station. You know, looked at this and I didn't realize that I built up stuff that was comparable to what was going on in the radio station. So I figured, well, I know what's going on. I'm do the tech stuff. The tech guys seem to be here all the time. 
so I went into the tech side of things, and that's pretty much where I remain professionally. Um, also, the other thing that, um, another piece of the puzzle was back in 88, my dad got me one of these, his old IBM XT computers, you know, the old monitor, monitor run it, and it had a motor. And I was aware of Freenet because he was poking around with Freenet, so I made an account of Freenet and logged in and I started poking around on the internet at that point. Um, and it was something I just poked around with from that point on continuously. Um, so, and that's, that's a side marker to keep in mind as we move along. So in the era of the, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it pirate station, as I poke around more and more, and signals got to be more and more, more powerful over time as I learned more, um, I started doing things, you know, of course being a DJ. So on a, uh, I figured I'd, for fun's sake, here's part of the story, I, I dug up some old clips. <coughs> The younger version of me being a DJ, I thought it might be kind of fun to listen to some of them. So this one here is me probably 15 years old or something like that. Being a just jockey. Eight forty-five in Atlanta, C-101 in Cleveland, <coughs> there, and Sarah. Big, just jockey. Fifty-nine minutes of Fresh Creek Banks Bad Kids with the number one song, Rick O'Casey. Rick, Rick O'Casey. Huh. Emotion, motion, there. Emotion, emotion, emotion. And at this point with this station, it's in the basement, things I built and I designed, figured out how the stations sound the way they do and built the same thing to do, to do that with the, uh, on the air as well. Um, over time, I um, got better at it, of course, and uh, I, I didn't label this clicker, so let's see what it's so you say you're out Okay, you all right. This is high school. I'll talk more about this in a second. So what this is, is we had a uh, high school PA morning announcement uh, thing going on at the high school. I fell into that obviously because I was in the radio. Now, when we first got there, when we first got there, So, when we first got there, the morning announcements were basically, you know, the, the old way of doing it. You read something, hit a little bell, and the next person reads something, hit a little bell. Uh, a bunch of us that got, in, that got into the radio room were all like media geeks. So, I fell into the right crowd. I mean, one guy, with his dream was to be a, a TV uh, an anchor, you know, to, to do that, and he did go on to do that. Another guy was into the whole production aspect of it. I was into the engineering announcement and all that. So we changed it from a little bell thing to like sophisticated sweepers and stuff for the station and announcements and things like that. And um, we had a lot of fun with it. Drove the administration nuts because I'll do things like, you know, that you have this meter. Now you can't let the loud volume get any louder than this, okay? Okay. So I knew that radio stations use all this sophisticated stuff to sound louder than it really is. So all of my stuff was produced to be squashed and really loud. So when it came out of the speakers, it was really loud. And when the principal would come in, he <coughs> tried to play it too loud. All right, now look, it's a right level, right? That's what he said. It's <laughs> a lot of fun there. Um, anyway, I, from that, during my time working in professional radio, one of the things that fascinated me was the AM talk station. And I had a fun time hanging around with all the producers and the talk show hosts. And, uh, and learning what it takes, what goes on behind the scenes to put together a yeah, talk show. Just walk here. You have me love. <laughs> so, um, and as a kid, believe it or not, I actually uh, would dial around a little AM radio I had, and uh, I fell in love with the talk radio, the whole theater of the mind that talk radio has. So I always had a fascination with that. So the AM station that we had there was um, um, 1300 WERE was one of the ones I took care of. 
And uh, these are some pictures I have, like um, this is one of the uh, talk show hosts, the late Merle Paulus. And one of this, these pictures I put up were kind of fun because the Cleveland Zoo would bring animals in and took into the studio and talk about the animals as part of the show. And he was always very uncomfortable with the animals. So here, there's a bear running around on his shoulder while he's trying to talk in the air, and he's being really distracted by it. And then he brought in a cheetah, a little baby cheetah, and it's banging the microphone around the studio where they're talking about it. A young version of me is standing behind the glass because I didn't want to be anywhere near the cheetah, but I was fascinated watching it. <laughs> so it's kind of fun stuff there. Um, and then one day, oh, during all of this, by the way, I was the chief engineer of the uh, college station, um, John Carroll's radio station, took care of all the tech stuff. And when I say I do the technical things, I was the guy that if anything broke, if the station went off the air or something broke, I was the one they were paid to say, it's broken, we need it fixed, or whatever. We're off the air, we need to go back on here. So it was my job to get back on. So I, my first job as chief engineer, the head engineer, was at this uh, JCU station. It was, it, since it was college, it was a volunteer, they paid some money, but, you know, it was mostly volunteer, but hey, you can get an air shift if you want. So I did a few music programs. Like, I hold an extra slot, and I figured that's what was going to trot my hand out at talk programming. So, what we're going to do on the college station, a little safer, but I had to, uh, dude, kill so it was. Um, so it was um, with the. You uh, had to deal with all the usual things you had to deal with. And, you know, you had to be careful about how you talk to people. You had to be really quick when people try to do something crazy on there that might get you an FCC fine. Um, but it was a fun training ground for what I wanted to do. So I got together with some folks and we did a um, just a, basically a morning show in the middle of the night, and then we had a two-hour shift. And we just did whatever. We did contests with callers on the air. And usually it was like kids that would call us. So we would think of things that would be crazy to do. Like uh, we called this the cordless phone challenge that the cordless phones were in the houses were threatening to do. So the thing we do is have them running around in the middle of the night doing things that would make noise for the contest. So they <coughs> get into the family car, blow the horn three times, and we'll do this. And that. <laughs> then we'd just hear it all on the radio. So we had fun with that. So that was like the first step of doing something with talk shows and engaging people and we did a pretty good job of getting the lines all filled and everything. Um, and then later on at this same station, uh, one day the general manager came and this is when the stage, this AM station was falling from its peak as being the powerhouse talk station. It was becoming, you know, nowadays it's a station nobody even knows it exists, but this was on that beginning of the slide, uh, halfway down the slide really. So the general manager came in and was talking to me and another guy. He goes, uh, do you want to do a, uh, you want to, an air shift? And I just kind of, we looked at him and I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, too. And so, okay, sure. You sure you really do want an air shift? I was like, yeah. The other guy goes, nah, I just said, yeah. And he looked at me, you really want one? <coughs> yeah. Okay, you got a show. Okay, when do you want to start? Give me a month. <laughs> So I ended up with this time slot on this station where they already had listeners on there. And so I got together with some folks that were doing similar things that we were, that we were doing on, on various college stations in town. And we decided to put together something that was a little more serious because now this is a real talk station, but we still had fun with it and it was called Night Talk. And it's a, it's kind of, I was, didn't know we were going to have a little TV here. I was expecting much more of a projector thing, but this is us in that studio. The young me when I had a bunch of hair and everything. And and the two other folks that we started the show with. And that was the show that really got me um, learning how you put together a, a program and make it entertaining and have something week after week after week with contests, figure out what guests you're going to have on and, and do the whole production. Um, a lot of experience there that I picked up on that. And that's also around that time is when this is in the early 90s, so the, <coughs> it was just about the time where the World Wide Web was starting to come into play, and it was a new thing. And we're all trying to figure out what we're going to do with this web. It's, going to have some, it's got to have some purpose to use. But the best we did was use it for email. Um, but, you know, the whole website thing for radio started to take up shortly after we, our time on that station came to an end. But I started looking at you know the internet seriously and saying, well, what can we do here? 
So we have in our Arab internet, um, like I said before, I used the, uh, was poking around mostly by email. And the, the most response we got were from people that were in our age group or a little younger at the time. We didn't really engage with the, with the audience that was already there. Um, and yeah, I covered all this stuff. But anyway, as we left out of that, we, you could tell that things were shifting. It was like a new, the, the internet was going to find its legs in some way or another. We just didn't know what it was going to be yet. So um, in comes the era of internet radio, where I was introduced uh, to a friend who was, um, who he became a really good friend. He was a young kid who was a lot like I was. He was 12 or so. And um, he was introduced to me by engineers. <coughs> Hey, you know the guy you need to talk to? You need to talk to Cornelius. He was a lot like you were when you were younger. So, so one day I'm at the John Carroll station coming in just to take care of some stuff, and there's this little redhead kid here going, Are you Cornelius? Yeah, what do you want to know? <laughs> and he goes, I heard so much about you. And you know, so he's going on and talking to me about what, you know, what he wants to do. And he had a station he built in his house, in his living room, his bedroom, in his parents' apartment. And, um, and I could tell he was a lot like I was, so we kind of bonded with that. So he kind of became my little brother from another mother really quickly. And I helped him out with things. And one of the things he introduced me to was this website where people, it was meant for like internet version of the CB. So you can talk to whoever you want and they'll key down and talk back, so to speak. Like I, I forget how to go the space bar or what. But he said, you know what some people are doing is they're just leaving the key button on and just playing music to each other as a DJ. I was like, huh, that's interesting. Can you help me set up something so I can do that? Okay, cool. So while we're setting this up and playing around, the, the website notices that people are doing this and they change their software around so it becomes a little transmitter so you can just turn it on and you're, you can play music or whatever you want to other people. And they started ranking the, the audience, you're breaking the stations by how many, how many, how many listeners they had. And so I poke around with this and it's like, this is kind of fun. You know, and he's like doing this, you know, this soft rock station format. So I started doing a music format, which is called Triple A, and I started one on the same channel too. And so with you know, between the two of us, we were pretty much always at the top of the list because the both of us had this these he's a radio geek, I was a radio geek, but working in radio, so we're doing all these radio like things, so we had the most slick sounding uh, stations there. Shortly after that, the whole internet radio thing formally started up, and so we moved on to the platforms for that, and I started in uh, city internet radio. And that's where I really get a chance to pour everything I had into something, because finally there's something new. I'm at the ground, the ground floor of this all, this whole new movement, a brand new medium that you can express, and you can own it. And so I did that, uh, got all the, the ASCAP and BMI licenses taken care of, which at the time was really no big deal, it was like 500 bucks a year for both of them. Send them what you're playing every so often, a sample of your uh, playlist, and you can just do it. And we just did it. The station started to grow. Um, we were up to, towards the tail end, about uh, 30,000 unique listeners a month. And we focused it at Cleveland, like we we're a local station. So most of the listeners were Cleveland based. We started getting people coming on board to say, I want to advertise on your station after a while. And we're like, okay, great. And we started working out deals to do that. And we had a lot of fun. So I have a couple of clips here of one of the uh, promos we had on the station for a show that I did with one of the DJs. The CG and Mary Beth Talio Morning Show. You never know what they're gonna do next. <laughs> Trying to take care of me, my roommate massage my feet, suck my toes, all that kind of stuff that's actually supposed to like, oh my god, that's the best. Have you ever had that? And Are you sucking on your toes? Yeah. Maybe that sounds kind of gross. Yeah, it was really good. Only if you shave your toes. Like, I shave my. Do you shave your toes? Do men? No. Men no. would not. I don't think no. men would shave their toes. Hey, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna pop. Shave my toes today. Yeah. <laughs> Want to shave? I should move as a baby's bottle. Yeah, I should move as a baby's bottle. Well, you, know, well, you shaved your toes, but damn it, can you cut those damn nails? The CG and Mary Beth Morning Show. Monday through Friday, 6 till 10. Only on the CityRadio.com. Great music.
No, the, the big voice guy was a friend of mine. We, we go back to our uh, early 20s. And um, he always had a really cool voice. And he was already working in radio like for a couple years by the time I met him. And the funny thing about it is that um, well, I was working in radio when I had the station, and, and, and a lot of DJs knew that I had the station. So one day they're like, can we go see your station? Okay, fine. Oh, sure, why not? Okay, great. So call oh, mom. Mom, there's going to be a bunch of people coming over to the basement. Uh, don't worry, they're okay. So we go down with all these disc jockeys, and they see the studio and go, cool, can we do a show? And they're all down there just doing radio shows. And it's like, you guys, you guys get paid to do this. Yeah, but people tell us what to do. We nobody tells us what to do here. So they always thought it was great. And the, the guy with the big voice was one of the guys that my friend, he would come over all the time. We got to be buddies and he would DJ shows just because he could. And he always had the big voice and I liked his voice. So he was like the voice of things that I've done for years. So the pirate stations onto the internet station and even onto the rocketry show. So, but now he's in New York and he does voiceovers for stations all over the world because that's his dream thing. And you probably heard his voice in other stuff like NBC Sports and things like that. So he's he's pretty good. We're still buddies, and I have this cool voice guy. Um, other times we had other D jockeys that kind of joined me on stuff, and uh, and I'll play a little promo here from that same morning show with another D jockey that we brought when I, when I was introducing her to the world. The CG and Mary Beth Talio Morning Show. You never know what they're gonna do next. We've got the uh, Linda who. Be doing the city, uh, the city radio dot com. They take voices. Wow. Okay. Yeah, she's gonna okay. talk for a second. Welcome to the CG Mary Beth Morning Show. I've got Mary Beth's headphones on backwards, so I'm, I'm hearing the right channel on the left side, yes. which is going to be very confusing so for me. So when you pan around to the right, it's on your left and on the left side. Yeah, all right. What you just yeah, did, I just did. Thank you so much. Linda, I don't want to freak you out, but um, this past week I was checked for head lice. <laughs> I swear, I've been watching the CG and Mary Beth Morning Show, Monday through Friday, six till ten, only on so, CityRadio.com. Great work. music, and actually, it's the there was the side of the record labels that was enjoying the fact that we were there doing this and promoting people and having listeners and promoting artists. So we actually got artist interviews. Uh, one of the pictures here of us doing a live broadcast with an artist uh, on location, um, which we actually got quite a few people in there, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, doing several broadcasts from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, talking to people. And um, we also brought back the show that we were doing on the college station, to, uh, the, the, the Goofy Show, and put it on the, the internet stations to try to bring you know this, this talk radio thing into the, the internet world. What we discovered really quickly is that the internet doesn't work very well for schedules. So we had the show on like at Friday nights at eight or whatever, and you learn really fast. While people were listening and they kind of enjoyed it, but nobody was going to go to their computer at such and such a clock on such a day to, to listen to anything. So at that point, it's like, okay, that's one thing that doesn't work for live radio with a traditional schedule. But the only thing we did find at work was high school sports. We put a high school sports game on there, and internet people will be there listening. And it was like the one thing you can get everybody piled in for. But for anything else, they'll either tune in and listen to whatever's going on, but they're not gonna go out of their way to get there. Uh, the only thing that killed, the, the big thing that killed this though was when the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed. And there were all kinds of draconian things for internet music stations. Uh, one of which is paying tons of money to, to sound exchange every year. And because we were, bought, we were on the verge of having people actually sponsor with us, one of the things they do is any money you make, they take most of it. And, and so it's like, what's the point now? You know, it's like you're never going to make enough money to do anything because you're going to always take it. So we shut that down really fast and went away. But um, so yeah, I just went through this whole the limitations with the uh, listener interaction. I'm going to skip to the next part. Oh, the other thing, too, was when we were doing all this, it was during the era of the dial-up connection, so most people still had dial-up. So if we wanted somebody to call you, they were they, they could either listen to you, or they could stop listening to you and call you. But, and we tried other tricks with doing those so early in the days of trying to do any live interactions, it just wasn't reliable. And, uh, and that linear program-based thing, schedule-based thing, just didn't work for the, um, for the internet. Um, 
But shortly after we shut down, a few years, the iPod came out. And then uh, a short time after that, this whole thing called the podcast um, started being bashed about. And when I heard about that, it's like that was the answer to our talk show right there, this, this podcasting thing. Um, the problem with, uh, and, and the cool thing about it is it got around that schedule thing because you can download a podcast, the, a program, and listen to it whenever you wanted to listen to it, whenever it worked in your schedule. So I was, that had a huge appeal. Um, downside of this whole thing is that you have to connect it to your computer and download things to it. And, and even to this day, for a lot of people, that's just a big pain in the butt. Um, and, and it was a pain in the butt for me because I didn't want to go through that either. But I knew that there was an answer there somewhere. There's another piece that had to come into play. And the other thing with podcasting at the time is because of the audience, people that were um, glomming onto it, it was always, it was just these, the coolest of the cool, hippest of the hip people that would do things, you know. And so anybody who could get what Adam Carolla was doing would listen. And he had a big audience, but it was a big audience of very specific people. And after that, the, the quality of things just fell off really quickly. And that was the big show at the time that, that took advantage of the podcasting. Um, but I still didn't want to give up on it. It was very fascinating to me because here, like for regular talk radio, when you're serving a city, you have to talk about a topic that can get you enough listeners that you can advertise and pay for it. And uh, so that means that you're pretty much limited to things that could grab huge audiences, like the Rush Limbaugh or whatever. And that didn't really appeal to me at all. But it could be, but with podcasting, you can aggregate enough people where you can probably do well with it. And you don't really need a big audience if you are the producer. And that was the other cool thing. You could be the producer and the owner of this program, and you just you just have to be able to make it work for you. And the other thing is you were the boss because you didn't have to be tied to some corporate guy that's going to tell you how to do what you're doing better. And, well, that could be okay, but half the time they don't get what it is you're trying to do anyway. Um, so, a little while later, the smartphone came out, and, and then I, at that point, I saw the smartphone and went, that could be the magic answer if it's done right, and it really perked up my attention. And also, around the, it, it shortly after that, a um, few years after the smartphone, then you had the explosion of the 24-7 listener, uh, well, internet user interaction. <coughs> Where there was the early, well, early days was MySpace. I didn't bother to put it in because it kind of imploded pretty quickly. But later on, it evolved into Twitter and Facebook and all that. So then you have this whole vehicle where you can communicate with people using this social media thing. Um, then eventually got to the point where the smartphones uh, were right, capable of just downloading shows straight to the phone. So you can subscribe to podcasts and it'll just appear whenever there's a new show. That was when I was like, okay, now I'm ready to jump in on this whole thing here. Um, and uh, and the other cool thing is, no matter what you're doing, if a new podcast comes down, it will just you can just download it into your phone. Um, so yeah. Then the next thing that happened was uh, 2009. I got back in the rocketry again, and it was. What it was uh, this event here. T minus ten, nine, eight. Took my daughter to see six. shuttle landing. <laughs> STS one twenty nine. And um, one zero lift off. That was not the view we had, of course. That's the rest of the world saw. Resupply. We were at the visitor center. Here. So what we saw was that, you know, the NASA visitor center, which was still cool enough as it was. And I was snapping pictures away. And it was a great feeling. The people that saw shuttle launches told me that be prepared is a very emotional thing. You know, they, and they to a person they would tell me, you know, I saw it and tears were running out of my eyes. Like, okay, I guess it's cool then, huh? So I'm taking pictures of it. I'm trying to look at the thing, and the flame is so bright you can't look at it. But I'm snapping pictures away, and then I realized, hey, there's tears rolling down my face. This is pretty awesome. And then that's when the fuse was lit because then I remembered all the fun I had as a kid flying rockets. So I got back in the rockets, full board, got a kit, um, found a local club, which is MTMA, and started having fun. 
And um, I wanted to connect to the Rockridge community big time because there's a whole lot that happened when I left. You know, this high power rock tree, which I heard things about when I was younger. I heard about the mythical F motor and stuff like that. And I thought it was cool. And I forgot about it. And I get back in and it's like, oh, these are regular things. And, and it goes where? It's like all these levels and it's electronics and it's like, this is heaven. So I, I jumped back in and I wanted to get knee deep and, and get me connected to the community. Um, I want to listen to a Rocketry podcast, so let me look for one. It's not me. So I go searching around for Rocketry podcast, and no one was doing it. Um, and then I went, aha, <laughs> this might be the, the, the magic bullet. So um, I did that, and I got the domain, the Rocketry show, actually back in 2010, and uh, just sat on it. And I started studying all the um, technology behind what makes a podcast go, what do you need to do, and start watching and looking at what, what are some of the top uh, uh, highly regarded podcasts that are out there. Uh, one of them, which was the Leo Laporte Twin TV stuff, oh, yeah. which I instantly got hooked on security now. <laughs> If you want to be paranoid about anything you do online, just get hooked on that podcast and you see all the, the, the wacky stuff going on out there that people try to get in their computer through the internet. But, I did, but they were very well produced and very well done, and Leo Port was having a lot of success doing it. So I followed what he did and a few other podcasts that I found. And as I went around and started learning the technology, one of the things I did for a few shows was to get the old gang, get the old band back together with the show that we did way back in college uh, radio days. At this point, we're all older, we all have kids, and everybody's scattered about the four points of the globe now. So I devised a way to, to through some of the equipment that I, that I design at work now, where I work now, to connect us all with high quality links back to my studio in the, in the basement, which I've always kept the studio going because I'm such a radio geek. Um, and we did a series of podcasts of that show. And while it was fun, it was like really hard to kind of stay um, connected because everyone's lives were crazy. But I got to experiment around and learn how to get the podcast loaded to a server. When you send it out, it sends out to multiple places. Some people found the podcast, had no clue what was even going on. You know, what is this? And then we get emails from people, what is this that you guys are doing? What's that? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, so any other, the ground was set. I, I could, I felt I was at a point where I could finally do this podcast for a rocket show. So um, Jim Seibel, Gene, you probably saw him running a little bit earlier today. He had to leave to get back home. This kid's not doing well. He's got blue or something. Um, but he, um, I met him at their club like uh, about a year before we started the show. We both are techno geeks. And we hit it off with each other big time, and we had this great rapport. I said, hey, you know, I've been thinking about doing this Rock With You podcast. You want to do it? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay, great. And I've asked a few people before, but most of the people didn't know what a podcast was. I mean, they were Rock With You guys, but they didn't know, and they were probably going to guess. I was like, yeah, I'll probably have to pull nudge them around a lot to make it go. But with Jim, I knew that if we get the two of us together, we'll do great. Uh, we did like a test podcast and it went so well that we just went ahead and posted it. And one of the things I did is I posted on, I went to post on the Rocketry forum uh, that, hey, there's a podcast on Rocketry that we just started up, check it out, let us know what you think. And so I go on there and I see a heading, you know, a TRF podcast. I'm like, oh, who got and did a podcast before I got a chance to publicize it? And I open up and there are people that found it and they were already talking about it in the, <laughs> the Rocketry forum. I was like, Wow, that's cool. I don't know how they found it, but that's cool. And I just kind of chimed in, yeah, we're the creators of it. Uh, let us know what you think. And that's how we started. It got started with it. And it, it already had legs before we even had a chance to promote it. So we just, there was this period of time where we were just kind of running to keep up with the, with the show to, to feed the interest that was just immediately there. So that was a lot of fun. And along the way, we started to uh, experiment around with trying to find channels to communicate with people. And that's when we stumbled into the uh, figuring out this whole social thing. Um, one of the things that we found that was interesting is when we started poking around about it on Facebook, we got reaction from people. 
uh, on Facebook about the show. There's a segment of rocketry folks that are just hang out on Facebook all the time. Um, so we created a presence, a page for the show that whenever there's a new show, it updates on a, on a static page. And we tried to communicate to people through this static page, but it wasn't really a good, it was really cumbersome, really. Cantankerous, as they say in the South. Um, so I started a parallel discussion forum, which you could do on Facebook, too. So there's an open discussion forum that's free form. Anybody can talk about what they want. And uh, so we put that up as well and plugged the two. And within a short period of time, the, the, that rocketry forum, the rocketry show forum on Facebook just kind of grew into its own monster. And it went from us having to feed things into it to get some people to, to react to it to the point where it just runs itself pretty much. You know, you throw something in there every so often, a headline, and people just start talking, and they post things and throw it in there. So that's one thing that we had a lot of success with. So uh, well, I'll touch on some more of that in a moment. Um, as the show evolved, though, uh, one thing, I'll just introduce all the characters. So on uh, this previous slide, I'll go back here. Uh, there's, you know, there's me smiling there and my selfie in the studio with the copy equipment. And uh, Jim, Jim in his bank, in his bathroom up at, up at his house in his rocket workshop, uh, I set him up with a remote mic and everything. So he's not in the same studio with me. He's remote. And then they <coughs> connect together. And, and that using, again, using cool stuff that allows you to make a connection and get high quality audio between the two of us through the internet where we sound we're in the same room with each other. And two of us get along so well together that we don't have to be in the same room. We just kind of groove on each other's wavelength and it's like we're in the same place. So we were the, we, we started together. Uh, the guy here, the, the guy with the uh, microphone, he's the big voice guy and he does the intro you hear on the Rocketry Show. The Rocketry Show with CG and Gene. So that's how we start the show up and uh, that's him in his studio in New York Very City. Late. That's his real name. Really? Yeah, he, he went by <laughs> Scott James as a disc jockey. Okay. And at some point somebody goes, dude, you should use your real name. Why? This is a perfect radio name, and nobody would think it's real. And then, so he, exactly. yeah. So he started using his name, not his business cards that he has. There's a hairy leg, shaking shape of a <laughs> leg with hair on it, his name on it. So, <laughs> so it's pretty funny. So yeah, he's, I, I, he, he's, he's cool. I, I'm glad he did as well as he did. And he's always been happy to do stuff for me with any of my projects as the voice guy. And uh, in fact, with the Rockford show, that's all I really had him say because we didn't know what we were going to do with the show. I just wanted somebody other than me starting the show up. So I was hanging out, spent the you know a couple of days at his house just hanging out because since he moved away, we haven't really had time to hang out. So he talks one day, you know, you need to get me to do to read more for your show. I was like, sure, why not? I, mean, I didn't want to take up your time giving you things to read for free when you got a business to run, but sure. So we finally sent him a whole bunch of stuff for it that was supposed to be for this season because uh, we have a new guy, Daniel Petrie, who goes by the Rocket View. Uh, he does this, uh, we, I ran into him because I stumbled on his blog called The Rocket View. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's like new in the rocketry and he likes to talk about all these little ticks, tricks and tips that he's learning as he's building model rockets and I thought that was really cool. Because Jim and I were kind of, you know, we're into that mode now. We're the only thing that really fascinates us are big rockets and big motors and lots of fire and lots of smoke. So the shows with us kind of tends to drift in that way. And I wanted to have someone who could be there for the everyday hobbyist that could talk about things that could apply to anybody. So I, we first thought we'll put them on and have them on every couple of weeks and talk about that, that those kind of topics just to kind of anchor the show into something that's more... Uh, that everybody can use. Um, so, uh, but he got along so well with us when we put him on as a test thing with us, and the chemistry was just instantly there with him and, and, and Jim and I, that I figured, you know what, we just have, we're still going to do the build things with you on a regular basis, but we're going to make you part of the show. Now, one of the things that for me that, uh, because I'm into the whole mechanics of how the show works and producing and pulling the strings, as they call it, um, I like being on the show to do things, but I like to be able to follow in the background and make sure everything runs fine. And that was kind of cool because Daniel and Gene can just carry on long periods of time with each other and I don't have to really say anything really. 
So I'll go back and make sure the levels are good, and sometimes I'm posting pictures on Facebook, hey, we're, the next episode is coming soon, and we're doing this. Again, tying in, building some excitement through the, the uh, social media kind of aspect. And uh, so it's been working out great having them on there. So those are the faces behind everything. So as I was saying, we were, um, our most active interactions right now is from the Facebook crowd. And the one thing we've learned really fast is that there are two distinct crowds that, we, that you have to serve. The people inside Facebook who tend to stay inside Facebook, whether it's rocketry people or whatever, and the people outside of Facebook. So now we've got the Facebook crowd down pretty much, I think. Uh, our, our discussion forum is up to over 200 members now, and the conversations come and go. We talk about what, anything that makes fire and goes up in the air, we talk about it. Um, and some of the topics that end up fueling that discussion forum turn into topics for the show. And the most recent one was this really in-depth conversation with John, who's busy, who his kids with him, he had the monitor, I believe, but he started this whole discussion on simulators. You know, I got this open rocket, how do I use it? And we had, and Daniel was sort of jumped in right away and was posting screenshots and just kind of walking through. And by the time it was done, he was playing tinkering around with open rocket. So I said, well, that's a topic. And because it was on here, if we're going to juggle, juggle the schedule around it, the guests we had, we're just going to put this on next while it's hot and fresh. So that's, that's something that grew out of the social media aspect that was happening off, off the air, if you will, that turned into a media topic on the show. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was great, and that all happened on Facebook. The challenge, though, is trying to get something going outside of Facebook. And we've got a forum that's part of our show that's on our website where people can go and talk about things. And about a handful of people found it, and we plug it on the show, and they'll talk about things on a regular basis, which is cool. And we're trying to figure out how do you plug that? Is that the right vehicle for it? So there's a lot that we're still trying to learn there as well. Um, the downside to Facebook, it would be really nice in Facebook if there was a way to leak that activity out of Facebook into some other space so that people who are not Facebook people or don't want to be bothered with Facebook or whatever, you know, there's all kinds of legitimate, legitimate reasons why you don't want to be in the Facebook space, you can at least see what's going on. And I, I monkeyed around and with the code and everything on the internet and found ways of kind of leaking sort of some of that stuff out. But so people see a static um, posting on our website as to what's being discussed on our discussion group, but they can't really interact with it because they're not on Facebook. Uh, that's that's something that bothers me, and they're, they're just you know I, I wish there was a way I could kind of spill that that back and forth outside. Even if there was a way to take something we're doing outside, feed it into Facebook, but Facebook does they can't make money on it, so they're not going to let it happen. So it's so it's, there's a pretty stiff wall between the two. That's a challenge that we're trying to figure out how to overcome, and I'm hoping that as we move forward, we try to start building our little forum offline for so that everyone else could have the same kind of rich interaction that we're having going on on Facebook. We don't have an answer, we're trying to figure it out still, but that's pretty much everybody in this social media world trying to figure out how to get sort of all pieces just right with that, and it's an ongoing thing. Um, the other challenge too with the social media space is that it's changing all the time. Um, right now, like Twitter became like a for a hot second we started was like a great vehicle for getting the word out and keeping people in touch. But now Twitter's kind of falling out of favor pretty fast. It's like looking like it's going to be like the MySpace of the of the uh, social media things before too long. And right now, I'm kind of trying to keep an eye out, and see what's okay. What's the next thing going on? Kind of seeing what my daughter is into, where you know, see what what the kids are getting into now that we can jump on and be a part of it early on. But probably for the moment, I don't understand what she's into just yet. So I'm still watching and trying to see if there's anything that looks like it'll work for us. But that's that almost is a full time job, just trying to keep keep track of what these changing pieces are on the internet. So you can jump on soon enough to be to have a presence there with it. Um, and, and the downside is that once one of these things fall out of favor, they fall out of favor fast. And, and, and just watching the, this, this cliff effect on, the, on Twitter. And part of it was Twitter's own doing because they don't really police uh, bullying very well. 
So people get bullied pretty heavily on Twitter, and it just turns off a lot of people as part of what's doing it. Uh, so that's basically uh, the big overview of what we did on the show, with the background of what I'm doing, and, and some of the things we're poking around, some things that work with us on social media, and some things we're still working on. So thanks for listening, and any questions you have about the show or whatever. Was it interesting? Yeah, very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. I posted a picture you did of the rocket nuke. <laughs> Just awesome. how good it is. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Cool, cool. You'll probably post it on the. Uh, he posted last night, he wished he was here, so I just replied with a picture of you. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the cool thing right there, is that you know, the interaction with people. <laughs> so developing content, I mean, I'll admit that I haven't listened to it. Okay, that's enough of that. You know, great, thanks for showing us, joining with us again, or whatever. Um, but the other advantage you have with the podcast is that we're not doing it live. Mm -hmm. So we'll record. Usually the shows go for sometimes twice as long as what you actually hear. Okay. But I'm able to like, then you take out dead stuff and condense it down to the best of the phone so and it seems to be okay now. A consistent experience. Okay. Uh, and that's. And I thought here, it, and the some people say, well, can you. I want to hear what you're doing live. But, we're, but we're this stopped growing. Ideas of at no, some like, point, no, doing like it stopped when we crash. have an interview with somebody, mm. it becomes its own mm. show where we put a thing in and out, and here's the guest, yeah, you know, and you can hear in real time that man. whole hour and a half or whatever <laughs> conversation we're having with no. the person. Mm -hmm. and and maybe have a way where you can interact in the questions. No. Yeah. Right. right. Then so we'll take that and point. chop it down. So, like, you know, if you're if you're watching your Facebook feed at the same time. Well, if, if people you know, know when battery. you're recording the show, or, or, or you know when you're actually doing the show, hours. and then they're flying in with some questions about, right. you know, so you Bob from Denver right. asks blah blah blah, right. and then you can get, mm -hmm. yes. but you, so you're, but then yeah, you have to get that whole so live yeah. thing. Yeah. Every time going. I get a good deal on yes. three, I grab it. So, so this so one kind of broke the screen and replaced it. At some probably at some they record point, 4K video. I'm just coming up with the next. Oh, I do. Something turns out great. Five eleven. A quick nice run of it, <laughs> right. and then you might not hear anything but for a little bit, and then we we'll right. do it again. So you kind of like have a live control. studio yeah. audience yeah. for something that's not live, it's right? Great. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Right. So that's that's the next phase of this whole thing with the interaction mm -hmm. experiment. Probably. What kind of tools are you using, like for um, for recording, editing, um, getting people? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind would be like Skype for. Two people talking to each other, but you're cool. probably needing something better quality than that. Okay, yes. At least at the audio. Uh, start off with some stuff yeah. that we made. Or or some no, dedicated like hardware that we made order. at work. So at least talk. But we started experimenting around that with good too, which is yeah. uh, yeah. In the service that runs through the Google browser. I could have seen you and stuff. It, stuff it, it does a pretty decent quality. So right now I've got Jim and Daniel <coughs> coming in on clean feet. He was picking on Jim a little bit. Into my studio. And the yeah, equipment I've got in the studio allows me to make, I have to make custom feeds back out to each one of them so that they don't hear themselves and things like that. Right, right. Um, so I patch all that stuff in at the studio beforehand. I, actually, I've got permanent patches where it's all there. Mm -hmm. um, so we use that for them. And Skype is typically either Skype or a phone hybrid, which I have a talk show phone system because that's what we make where I work. We make okay. all, basically all the talk show phone systems that you hear are ours. Mm -hmm. So I have that in the studio too. So if a guest is not able to do Skype, I can do you know the high quality phone call. It's no different than NPR or any station mm -hmm. that would have somebody on the phone, and they can be on that way. So the Chris Pearson interview we did, we Chris Pearson was one of the few people that were actually on the phone. Mm -hmm. Most people were you know were able to at least you know rig up Skype somehow on their, their right. computer. Okay. Um, and then there's all kinds of gear that I have, but that manages that makes sure that when you know, uh, make you all kinds of compression limiting things and processing devices, so that if any one of us breaks in the laughter or guests are saying something loud, you're not hearing distorted audio or something overloaded. So it's got all right. the automatic level control things. But again, it's all stuff that I built up over time in the studio for other reasons with various projects I had. So by the time we roll into the show. 
and all the gears I could use and deploy for this. How difficult would it be to make that mobile, so to speak? Like if you wanted to provide, okay. I mean, like like you're doing now, you're going around from place to place with you know high quality mic mm -hmm. and your and your phone, and you're recording the audio there and everything. Yeah. Um, what if you wanted to give something like live coverage from an NSL or a NARAM or we, or something like that? Last year we did. We had the entire setup there. We actually did a show in a room like this with a portable setup mm -hmm. and an audience there. Right. So we they got to see us how this sausage was made because we did a whole show mm -hmm. and they knew that if some of this stuff may be in there, some of it may not be because they're going to edit it, so don't worry about it. Right. If you make a mistake, just say, yeah, that's a mistake and I'll know to edit it out later. Okay. Leave it in the bloopers. Mm -hmm. Leave it in the bloopers. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, we, we got the You know, it's sometimes, some, sometimes in the show we either have some major blooper happen or after we're done and we're all just discussing, some piece of gold happens. And if I have it still be recording, I'll take it and stick it at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did that a couple of times. But but yeah, so we've done that with uh, LDRS. So LDRS, we had an outdoor setup, and we were going to do the whole show outside in the mm -hmm. tent that, that was provided. Okay. We were like right off in the flight line. Mm -hmm. So I had to make sure that the um, microphones we have were directional enough that it wouldn't pick oh, up the, a launch. the rocket launches. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of high powered launches. Oh, yeah. It mics work. worked great because it was all it was really super loud to us and we couldn't really tell if we were getting good recordings or not, but when you play it back, that stuff was just in the background and everybody was in the foreground. Sweet. So it started coming out fine, but then the weather turned bad, so we were indoors. I heard about that. that. Yeah, I heard about that. So we got some we started we got the ball rolling and then we were shut 